gonna fight, fight, fight for Iowa. Let every lawyer Iowa see. Hey, Mad. Hey, there we go. There. Hello and welcome to Sports Opinion, the weekly sports talk show on Channel 18. My name is Dirk Keller. Over here is Bud Supel, and we've got a very special guest here, the First Lady of Iowa. Here all the time. It's his show. And we've got a very special guest here today, Fred Mims. For 38 years, one of the University of Iowa Athletic Department's top administrators, 38 years, three athletic directors, recently retired as of June 30th, into the fiscal year. And uh, Fred, we welcome you here and yeah. pleased to have you. Well, it's my pleasure being here. I, I watch you all uh, from time to time, and I'm honored to have an opportunity to sit and talk with you. Great, great, That's great. great. Well, appreciate it. Um, Who was the best athletic director? <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> the one that hired him. But, 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 easy, but easy to answer. The best for me, personally, was uh, Bump Elliott. Yeah, yeah. Bump was a great mentor of mine and taught me a lot of things administratively that I used and, and, and had great success with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we won't talk about the other stuff. Yeah. But as far as a mentor, Bump Elliott was the best for me. Yeah. Great. And he's the one yeah. who hired you. He's the one that hired me and gave me the support to create a support service for our student athletes. Is as that well, right? As well as a compliance program for the student athletes at Iowa. They took great pride in wanting to do things the right way, and uh, with every president that uh, I served under as well, they were very supportive. So mm -hmm. I had great support. That's great. Now, <clears throat> he wasn't just an athletic department administrator because Fred came here to play baseball, and I don't know if you guys know this, but Fred also played basketball here I at the that. University of Iowa. Uh, Two-year letter winner for both basketball and baseball. Uh, from Galesburg, Illinois, not too far from where mm -hmm. I grew up, hometown of also another former Hawkeye great, Jim Sundberg, mm -hmm. a teammate of yours. That's right. So, Fred, what got you to Iowa City? Well, you hit it on the, on the head when you said Jim Sundberg. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because Jim Sundberg and his father, Howard, were good friends of the family. Uh, Jim and I played Little League mm -hmm. uh, against each other and with each other in Babe Ruth and, and American Legion Ball. And uh, Howard was very instrumental in working with the young kids in the neighborhood. He was also our, our postman, and he got to know my, my mother very well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, through conversations with my mother, they kind of convinced me to come to the University of Iowa. They said, I will need you. So, <laughs> so I ended up coming to Iowa. I was committed to go elsewhere. but. Uh, where were you thinking of going first? Uh, down in Florida. There was a school in Florida that I thought about playing mm -hmm. for them. Uh, but the Sunbergs talked me into uh, trying the University of Iowa. I had never stepped foot on campus until the Sunday before classes started. <laughs> wow. I hadn't seen anybody, any facilities. My parents drove me up, dropped me off, and we had a dorm room set up for me. And I. I loaded my stuff in the dorm room, the next day I went and registered for classes. I hadn't <laughs> seen anything at campus. You, had yeah. you met Coach Banks? Had not met Coach Banks. <laughs> really? Or Coach <clears throat> Schultz, Dick Schultz was the basketball coach. Yeah. yeah. Hadn't met any of these guys, but my reputation of being a talent that uh, I had back, I've been recruited by a number of people. And so, it, it, in a large sense, I was surprised to them that I ended up here at Iowa. I'll be darned. I didn't know that part of the story. So a family connection basically got you here. That's what got me here. And, and you know, yeah. I feel very, very fortunate to, to have that opportunity to come to the University of Iowa. When they first asked me about going to I said, Iowa, where, where's that? Who's there? And all those <laughs> kind of things. All those things came out. Yeah. But I, I found out that uh, later on that a couple people from Galesburg, athletes from Galesburg, baseball players, uh, had came up here. And, and they thought highly of their experiences here. The other person that was very instrumental in, in talking to me, somebody who I tried to mimic my basketball after was Dale Kelly. I was going to ask you about it. Now, these guys don't know who Dale Kelly is. Dale was super. He was <laughs> a silver streak. He was a silver streak. Galesburg silver streak. <laughs> okay. Galesburg silver streak. He's a leading scorer in, in, in high school history. He went on to Northwestern, played very well. Dale scored 54 points in a basketball game. <laughs> yeah. And he could jump out of the gym. He was only about six foot. I six saw five. him play he, he, in high school. In high school. He was you great. bet. 
And so Dale had talked to me about the different schools to go to and, and where I could play basketball. And being at Northwestern, he had played against Iowa mm -hmm. and knew what they needed uh, also. And so that's another reason mm -hmm. that I thought I could play both sports here. Now, was Dale older than you? Yes. One, one year, maybe? Uh, he was Something? two years. Two years? Two years. Yeah. So were you teammates with him in Galesburg? I was on the sophomore team when yeah. he was a senior, but the next year I inherited his jersey. Uh huh. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I wish you that was quite have. an honor. <laughs> yes, it was. Did you score fifty-four points also? <laughs> uh, not quite. You know, uh, uh, our uh, basketball coach um, wouldn't allow us to shoot very much. He said, yeah. "You got to play a team ball here, at Gillsburg. If you, anybody goes off in one man show, then we won't win." <laughs> was his yeah. name Theo? John Theo. Uh, I'll be darn. Yeah. Good memory there, Dirk. Well, I, my dad was a basketball coach in Illinois, and we went to the state tournament every year. And Dale Kelly, to that point, would have been, was that 1970, his senior year? 69 or 70. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, 68, I think. Was it? No, no, it was early in that, actually. Dale was two years, 67. I'd never seen okay. anybody like him. Oh, yeah, he was fabulous. fabulous. And yeah. from everything I remember... A really nice guy. Super nice guy, very intelligent. <clears throat> you know, he graduated from Northwestern, got drafted by New York Nets, I think, and he played a little bit, but then he ended up being a banker, and he was associate VP of Harris Bank in Chicago at one time. I'll be darned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be darned. Well, it's a small world. So, two-sport athlete in Galesburg. Yes. Comes to Iowa City, sight unseen, to be a two-sport athlete here for the Hawkeyes. Little did you know that you would spend your entire <laughs> career, virtually your entire career, at the University of Iowa. Save three seasons, or four, with the uh, Houston Astros organization. Yes, I played with the Houston Astros organization. Unfortunately, I, I injured a knee and oh. that ended my career. But, you know, I, I felt very fortunate to have some good mentoring there. You know, when I, my first spring training, I must have hit seven, eight home runs in spring training. And the major league guys kind of adopted me. Hey, yeah. Susa Lou oh, yeah. nicknamed me Tater Man. Tater. <laughs> Tater. Yeah. Tater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we had um, uh, a couple other guys came and would give me pointers. You know, one of the pitchers, all star pitcher, he used to come in and talk to me in my room about the bat that I swung. You know, this is too heavy a bat. You know, this is what I'm going to do to you later in the season. You need to get more bat speed. How, how, big, how many ounces was your bat? Mine was 35, 36 inches, 35 ounces. Yeah. So it was, it was a heavy bat. But I felt it was long enough that I can get the kind of uh, uh, velocity that I needed to drive the ball. But anyhow, in meeting those professional guys, it, it was a treat. Lee May gave, oh, yeah. gave me a glove. Yeah. Juan Pizarro was in his career, and I was his card playing buddy. Every time I walk in, I'm like, come on, we gotta play cards. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a pleasure, and, and I had made strides, but the injury, it happens in sports. And that goes back to um, a scout that drafted me out of high school, Bill Prince, that uh, told me, go to college, get, get your degree, pro ball will be for you. And he was in my living room. I was drafted fifth round by the Chicago Cubs. Hmm. Oh, okay. And um, <clears throat> contemplating such so a sign or not sign. And, but he said, you know, you got people interested in you for college basketball as well as, as baseball. Get your education, pro ball will be for you. I'll be darned. And what he says, if anybody asks you why you didn't sign, don't tell them I told you not to sign. Yeah, <laughs> but my job is to sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now let's see. I'm trying to think of some of those uh, Houston Astros back then. Was Jimmy Wynn in the organization then, or was he gone? He was gone. He Jimmy went to Wynn LA, I think. Yeah. Uh, Cliff Johnson played. Doug Rader, Metzger was playing. Uh, Cesar Sedani oh, yeah. was the big star in center field. Um, Scipio Spinks was on the sure. team of pitchers, so Cardinal. a lot of those guys were still around. I'll be darned. And who was the owner of the Astros? Was that Drayton McLean back then? I don't recall. I, I wasn't too much in the ownership back then. So you didn't have to worry yeah. about the general yeah. manager more than anything else. Where did, they, uh, where did you play? Right. What, uh, <laughs> what position? I played outfield. Uh, one year I played first base. Uh, actually, I, I made a mistake. Uh, I wasn't an infielder. I chose to be an outfielder in high school. 
But I thought it was a pretty good outfielder. I, you know, I made the Pan American Games team. Uh, Bob yeah. Winkle was the coach, and you know, we got beat by Cuba in the championship game. And I started and batted the uh, fourth or fifth in, in, on that team. Mm -hmm. Fred Lynn was one of my teammates. Wow. Um, yeah. And, but um, you know, the coaches change, and and and, and, and things change a bit too as they work. But you get to know them a little bit. But. Um, I enjoyed the sport, you know, and I enjoyed the opportunity professionally. I played outfield. I played first base that one year. Uh, I made the mistake of, of getting in as a first substitute at first base because somebody got hurt. And somebody hit a line shot, and the bases were loaded, and I snared it like it was nothing, stepped on the bag, and threw a strike to home plate to, to double the guy up. And they kept that in mind. So the next year, they, I was practically uh, 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 at first base, first. and that was a big mistake. But coaches watch you, they, they work with you, they see certain mm -hmm. things, and they saw some talent in me, so I played first base for you. Yeah. Okay. What uh, what teams did you play for? What towns? I played in Cocoa, Florida, uh, or Orlando area. Mm -hmm. I played for, what's it, Columbus, Georgia, where a double-A team, I was on that, that team. And I played Cedar Rapids for two years. Oh, you were? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. I'll be. Uh, were you there a whole season in Cedar Oh, yes, yes, yes. Matter of fact, I made the All-Star team, and, and I got inducted in their Hall of Fame. I didn't know A few that. years back, yeah. yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> I knew they'd been a Cardinals affiliate and an Astros, of course the Reds. The first year they had the Astros there, I was, yeah. I was on that team. Were they the Cedar Rapids Astros? Mm -hmm. okay. Cedar Rapids Astros. <laughs> I'll be darned. And I, I led that, uh, that that franchise in triples for 20-something years. Oh, really? goodness years. sakes. <laughs> <laughs> Big hitter. So yeah. what led to the end of your career? The knee injury, obviously. The knee injury took care of that. Uh, they had talked to me about staying on and, and being a... Uh, a scout or a manager in an organization because they, they like my knowledge of the game as well as my ability to, to uh, detect talent. But I had to get away from it. And so I was coming back to Iowa in the off season working on my advanced degree and helping the baseball team a bit and with Dwayne. And um, when I became injured and, and I was looking what I was going to do, Dwayne enticed me to come back here to the University of Iowa and work here. So you didn't need to get away from baseball, but Major League Baseball? I need to get away from Major League Baseball. Yeah. You know, when you work in that environment and you work hard, and you know you're one of the top uh, people in that organization, and then you get an injury and you see yeah. others who are still doing well. Jim Sundberg uh, was wow. talking to me one time, and he says, Fred, he said, why this for me and not you? You were always the better athlete mm -hmm. and baseball player. Plus, said, Jim, it was meant for you, it wasn't meant for me. There's another path for me in life. And he went on and had a great uh, career. One year, he sure career. did, yeah. Here in Iowa? Yeah. The 70 and 72, through 72. Okay, 71, okay. 72, 72. And 72, 1972 was the one and only year the Hawkeye baseball team went to the World Series. Was that your senior year? Yes, that was my senior year. Yeah, so, I'd love to talk about that 1972 season. Well, it, it was an interesting season. It was one that had its ups and downs, and, and I think the the upside was the best you could ever expect because we started out a year going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Really didn't have a, a lineup settled, and there was a lot of uh, contention going on amongst the players and, 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 and coaching staff about who should be playing, who shouldn't be playing, and who's getting a chance, who's not getting a chance to play. And so we started out on a very bumpy road, and then we called a team meeting of players to try to talk through the issues. Whose idea was the team meeting? <laughs> it was mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that team meeting kind of changed the course of the season. It changed the course of the season. Uh, it was a situation where I had been drafted again by San Diego after my first year here. And I had made the Pan Am team, and, and like I said, I played with Fred Lynn and, and did really uh, a nice job, I thought. Uh, and then when I came back, I got drafted again that winter, third round, by the Milwaukee Brewers. Wow. And um, they had talked me into not signing the coaching staff and, and thought I'd project better in, in the spring. And so as the team got off to a rocky start, you know, one of the things I wanted to express to my teammates is that I came here for a reason. 
and what you're doing and this bickering we're doing is not making us a better team. And so let's go around the room and talk about who has what concerns. So we started with everybody, okay. and then we would say, that's a sounds like a personal problem. You have to deal with that. It's not a team issue. That's not on the table. And we flushed things out, mm -hmm. and then uh, Dwayne came in, and we had a, a conversation with him about some of the, the real issues that needed to be addressed. And he was willing to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And after that, it, everything started gelling. How many players were involved on the team at that time, and, and who were some of the players on that team with you? Oh, Mike Kilcoff. Mike Kilcoff. He's from uh, uh, work buddy. Mike did a real nice job. He he was one of the ones that. Wasn't in the lineup much, right. yeah. And um, a number of people felt he should be in the lineup, and so we made some suggestions. Dwayne made a change, and Mike started playing more. Mm -hmm. And Mike did a nice job for us. Ray Smith was a shortstop. Uh, Larry Sucius was the left fielder. Uh, Jim Sunberg, of course, was catching. Uh, Tom Hearn was at first base. My old boss on TV uh, at KCRG. Oh yeah, yeah. Tom was a great guy. Great guy. And Brad Tricky played third base. And Brad has passed. From Cedar Rapids? From Cedar Rapids. Yeah. yeah. He was a freshman on the team that year. And Dave Blazin played right field for us. <coughs> he was from New Jersey area. So that was our starting lineup. And um, we did very, very well. And yeah. Mark Chop was our pitcher, one of our pitchers. And Bill Heckroft was another pitcher for us. Mike Keelkoff, was he from Cedar Rapids? Is that where he Tumwood. Yeah. Tumwood? He and I worked for Daryl Brown when I was in school. Oh, okay. I think Mike was in grad school, and uh, what a great guy. Yeah, yes, yeah, super pressure. I, I guess he's back in the country. He was, <clears throat> he was overseas for a bit of his professional career, but he's he's back in the country. I think in Waterloo area right now. Is he? Yeah. And this one was when the Iowa baseball field, Fred, was... Uh, you hit your home runs right down to Melrose Avenue. No, oh, I try to hit it over Melrose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It was right there yeah. behind the field house. It was a, a great diamond. But the wind kept blowing uh, the, the opposite way for most of the, the, the time. But that day against Northwestern, I was able to get a couple out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had two? Yes. You had two home runs in the Big Ten championship game against Northwestern. Um, what was the final score of that game? I think it was 10 to 5. And <laughs> now I have a question. What about the Big Ten season? Did you play everybody? No, we did not. We, didn't. we <clears throat> had a few rained out games that we didn't, didn't count against. I think we were 13 and 3 or something like that, and we ended up winning the championship by percentages. But every Big Ten team was on the schedule? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy. So, do you remember what your record was uh, for the year? For the oh, gosh, I do not remember that. They didn't play as many games, I'm it sure, was, as they do now. It was 25 and 17, I think. Okay. During the year? Yeah. We, we reached 30 when we played the tournament, I think. Did you? Yeah. Uh, Tom Hearn, <clears throat> first baseman? First baseman. Yeah. He and I uh, play, uh, worked at KCRG together for seven years. Mm -hmm. He talked a lot about you. He talked a lot about that season mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and just how special Is it was. Is that the 72 season? Yeah. Yeah, the 72 yeah. season. And Tom also tried to play basketball. Mm -hmm. He said he played one or two years. I can't remember. Uh, I believe, well, he talked about, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the, the big basketball player who never played for Iowa. But Connie Hawkins. Connie Hawkins. Oh. He said that people would show up for the freshman games. More yeah, people would show right. up for the that freshman games. That was true. <laughs> that's right. To see Connie Hawkins. Now, was, did you play with him? No, I did not play with Connie, but I got an interesting story about Connie Hawkins. Uh, I was on the USA team, the Pan American Games team. We were over in. For baseball. For baseball. Mm -hmm. We were over in, in Cali, Columbia for the Pan American Games. And I met this, this young lady from New York University. And we hit it off, and we were going places, and a group of us were talking and so forth. So we were out one night just sitting around chatting, and she said, Now, what school are you from? I said, Iowa. I was the no, University of Iowa. And Iowa City, Iowa? I said, Yes. Yeah. She, she looks at me. Hmm. My uncle went to school there. I said, Huh? Who's your? 
Connie Hawkins. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> Her name was Deborah Hawkins, and she was a hurdler from New York University. <laughs> really? Small world. Small world. She was telling me all about the family and all about the situation yeah. from their perspective. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, it sounds like Connie didn't get a fair deal, but uh, back then, things were, everything was different. Uh, freshmen weren't eligible to play uh, sports other than mm -hmm. freshman teams. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a freshman baseball team, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, I, I transferred in, though. See, I didn't come as a freshman. I transferred right. in. I, and so I didn't worry about that. Where'd you transfer from? I went to Spoon River Junior Spoon College. Spoon River. Mm -hmm. And that's, is it in Galesburg? No, it's in Canton, Illinois. Canton. Okay. okay. I knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still there? Yes. It is. It is still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you spend two years there? Two years. Two there. years. Correct. So you're looking for a place to go. And well, I had, I had other offers yeah. from there. I had offers out of high school, and then I, I couldn't go directly to a four-year school out of high school. I could have, but I didn't because <coughs> if I went to junior college, I could have signed any time. Mm -hmm. Once you come to college, you got to wait till you're 21 after your junior year. Uh -huh. So the scouts okay. had worked that out for me. And they wanted me to go to Mesa or to a, a school down in Florida. Um, I can't think of a junior college down there. Miami-Dade uh, Community College. And, um, I didn't do that. I went to Canton, Illinois, Spoon River, because it's close to close home. To home. Close yeah. to home. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Big Ten baseball. Uh, Tom Herring would tell me stories about some of the guys in the Big Ten, some of the players in the Big Ten, like uh, uh, Dave Winfield from Minnesota. Dave Winfield. Well, basketball and baseball. Yep. Yeah, Dave was a very talented athlete and became mm -hmm. a good friend of mine. Really? Yeah. Let me tell you a story. Um, my first year here, I was one of the leading hitters in the country, and um, hitting 400 and something. And we played Minnesota here in our diamond, and Dave was pitching. And so I was talking to Ray Smith, and I was batting third in the lineup. I think, <coughs> and we had those flat hats, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we also yeah. had the ear, the, hat, <laughs> the ear thing. And Dave was throwing. I was watching him throw. I told Ray, I said. I think I'm going to wear the double flat ear. <laughs> <laughs> so I get up to the plate, and I, and my turn to play, and I take the first pitch just to check the speed out, you know. And then I dug in the second pitch. Boom! Hits me in the head. I'm, oh. in, I'm in the dirt, and I'm starting to get up. And who's there picking me up? The day he came off the mound, and he rushed down and picked me up and said, Fred, I didn't want to hit you, man. You and I are two brothers out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not <laughs> Did it break your helmet? <laughs> well, he was a big man. He stood oh, about my. six feet, what, six? Six, six, yes. And he was not skinny. No, he, he, well, he was solid. Yeah. Solid and can jump out of gym. He played basketball, too. Yeah. You know, he was a very, very talented athlete. Tommy Heard said, I've never seen somebody hit a ball as far as Dave Winfield. But Dave could light it up and, uh, you know... <laughs> He's in the Hall of Fame, so, you know, he's yeah. a lot right yeah. Well, uh, who else played in the Big Ten that we might remember? Did Steve Garvey? Garvey had, yeah, but he was earlier than I, so uh, he didn't. Uh, Kirk Gibson. Oh, uh, Michigan State. Both Michigan State guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, Rob Ellis was one of the better players in the league, and he, he played at uh, Michigan State. Oh, I can't think of him. What yeah. kind of guy was Kirk Gibson? Did you get a chance to know him? Never got to know him. Never got to know him. I watched his son play this year at Michigan State. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Baseball. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Forgot yeah. about that. Outfielder. Yeah. Um, so, where did Iowa end up in the regular season after Big Ten ball had concluded? Before the Big Ten tournament? Were you in first place? We didn't have a Big Ten tournament. Oh, there was. It's they're just based on rankings where you finish. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And Northwestern was good that year. They were pretty good that year, correct. And uh, we were able to beat them. And I know Michigan State was up there with us. And they got rained out of a game over the weekend to huh. avoid a tie, I think it was. And we ended up winning. So. And the NCAA only took the conference champion back then? I thought that was the way they worked in the conference championship. Very few teams were, were entered, not like they are chosen today so 
we were able to represent the, the, the Big Ten in the tournament, and we played in Bowling Green, I think it was, for the regionals, mm. and we lost the first game, came back to the loser's bracket to win uh, and go on to the College World Series. So played at Rosenblatt Stadium. Played at Rosenblatt Stadium. And uh, who did you, was it, I'm trying to remember, I read, was it UCLA? Arizona State. Arizona State. Okay. Uh, they were ranked number one in the country. Sheesh. I think they were 50-something and three. In the oh, year. my. And they beat us, I think it was two to one. Is that right? Yeah. Anybody of note on their team? Oh, uh, I can't recall. Uh, Alan Bannister was oh. the shortstop. Uh, Kenny Reed was the second baseman. And, and very talented squad. Uh, I can't recall the others. Yeah. Yeah. I know those two because they played with me on the fan team. Yeah. Now, was Arizona State coached by uh, Itchy Jones then? No, uh, actually, um, Bob Winkles ah. was the coach. Bobby Winkles was with the Giants organization, if I remember. He, 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 he was in the major leagues. I can't remember right. what organization he was yeah. with, but uh, great man, great coach. And, uh, actually, um, he was a coach the year before. I think he might have left, and, and someone did take over for their team that year because uh, he signed to become manager in the major leagues. I wonder if that was H.E. Jones. It might have been. Mm -hmm. yeah. was a <clears throat> How many teams did the NCAA take then? Back then, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. I yeah. think the World Series had the same amount of teams it you does do? now. I didn't think Eight it did. Eight teams? I think it did. But did they start out with, like, what, 32 maybe? Or? Uh, uh, was it 64? I don't know if it was 64. It was quite a few teams, but you had, yeah. you had back then they played more towards a regional champion, and they had more mm -hmm. northern schools involved, and you had southern schools and western schools, and then you converged them all, uh -huh. the winners. And they, you know, we represented a region here in the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, but now that's still. Goes on till the middle of June, doesn't it? Yes. It, it, so how many teams do they have now? They uh, they might have sixty teams now because they, okay. they got the regional, then they got super regionals, then they have yeah. the World Series. All in Omaha? No, 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 no just the World Series. top just, uh, teams. Just yeah, okay. Final eight teams. Right. You graduated yeah. in seventy three. Seventy two. Okay, I was the president of I Club in seventy three. And they won the championship, I think. The, the Hawkeyes? Baseball, Big Tens? The baseball was back in the runnings again, but I don't know if they won or tied. I don't know. Somewhere it was up there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I noticed that uh, they, uh, we had a, uh, a special dinner for them, and we gave each player a baseball bat with their name on it. Oh, wow. that's, <laughs> that's a nice touch. That was nice. Yeah. Very nice, yeah. yeah. Back then, there wasn't nearly as much paraphernalia and, and, and huh. what we That's call right. today swag, yeah, yeah. you know, for the kids. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. for sure. You know, now they've got everything. <clears throat> I think they, they had 73 champions or something. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I always tell people when we talk about <clears throat> today's athletes versus in the past, I say, you know, us older people, all we can say, we're just born too soon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. I think we were born just right. <laughs> just right. I mean, you got to play on the old field. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was in school, that wasn't the baseball field anymore, but it's where our PE class would have mm -hmm. class up there and uh, softball. Yeah. And I remember thinking, how the heck could this have been the baseball field? <laughs> You'd hit it right into carts as they're driving by. The, Put it you right in somebody's them. window. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, you mentioned when Dave Winfield hit you with a pitch <clears throat> that he said, you know, didn't mean to hit you, Fred. You're the only brother out here. You were the only African-American player on the Hawkeye baseball team, and I'm guessing there weren't many others in Big Ten baseball back then. No, there wasn't, and that's unfortunate. <clears throat> there maybe were three of us in the, in the league at the mm -hmm. time. Wow. And um, uh, it had to be tough. Well, it, it was tough. Baseball was a tough nut to crack into. At one time, when I coached here at Iowa as well, there might have been only one or two other Afro American head coaches in baseball in the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. uh, Coach Baker was at Kansas State, I think he was, and, and, and he was one I got to know very well. But, you know, things have changed a bit, but not markedly so. 
uh, if you start looking at who has programs around the country. You know, Bo Porter uh, is a good friend of mine, and uh, he, he was able to make it in, in the major leagues yeah. as a manager. Yeah. And, you know, he wanted to be in college also, and, and maybe someday he'll, he'll go back to college and be a coach. But very few uh, African Americans are, are taking the lead in, in coaching, managing programs. You know, for a bunch of crusty old white guys like us, and let's face it, most of our audience here in Iowa City is white, we can't really appreciate what it was like to travel as the only black player on a team. And, uh, and, and some of the things you'd hear, some of the things you'd experience, uh, I'm, I'm guessing in places like Bloomington, Indiana, uh, even probably Champaign, Illinois, Lafayette, uh, well, further south. People are people, and, and no matter where you go, you encounter some bigger trees. So, you know, yeah. you, 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 you get used to that. Uh, I remember playing up in Bowling Green, up in that area, and there was a, a gal who was watching the game. We met some students afterwards. and. We were talking, and she, she was talking to me. And she was kidding around. She said, "You know what you look like out there? I said, well, a fly in a bowl of milk." <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Now, there's a new one I've never heard. <laughs> never heard of That's a new one. Of milk. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, growing up in Galesburg, who were your heroes as a boy? St. Louis Cardinals. That was my team. Yep, same here. You know, I wanted to be, I played Little League, I was a Cardinal. I had a little bird and everything on home, mm -hmm. everything I could, yeah. you know. And I knew every player. I listened to their games. Who was it? playing that musical? Uh, uh, yeah. Slaughter? Yeah. More Gibson and More Brock. More Gibson, okay. Brock, and, and, yeah. and that, yeah. that crew. Okay. Um, they were very talented, very good, but they, when they lost, I kept saying, Man, when I get bigger, I'm going to be on this team, we're not going to lose, and so forth. That's so when I was a senior in high school, I mentioned earlier, and then all of a sudden I get drafted by the Cubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're living in Cubs country in Galesburg. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But it was, uh, it was good to be able to, to grow up at the time when uh, athletes stayed with certain teams yeah. throughout. You didn't see a lot of this. Just jumping around, and and the National League team were the National League teams, and the American League team with the American League team, and none of that switching around. Bob Gibson, what a pitcher he was! Oh yes. yes. Oh boy, and how many complete games did he throw? Well, he was huh? something else. That was, must have been before relief pitchers, right? <laughs> well, he still got the single complete season game. earned run average record, at, and it's just above one run per nine innings. And, is that right? And right now, Zach Granke with the Dodgers is threatening that record. But we still got half a season to go. Oh, so yeah. We'll see what oh, happens. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you look at Zach Granke, you think that's. Magical season. Uh, year was it? 66 or 7. They yeah. lowered the mound. Yeah. Because of Bob Gibson. Yeah. yeah. They felt that it was, it was just too big and too, uh, too high above the batters. So uh, they changed the rules. Now, what radio station did you listen to? Did you listen to KMOX out of St. Louis? Yes. You could pick them up in Galesburg? You could pick them up in Galesburg. That's what we grew up listening to. Harry Carey yeah. on KMOX with yeah. Jack Buck. Yep, yep. And uh, life was good. That's it a combination there. It was, you know, yeah. every night I'd go to bed with that transistor radio. Yeah. <laughs> that I got for doing paper route. And yeah. it had 1120 AM on it. I'm guessing Earl probably did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a good time in the 60s. They went to the World Series three times, won it twice. I listened to WGN. Yeah. Well, that's what my cousins did here at Galesburg. My cousins who grew up near Galesburg, we'd get together and it was war. <laughs> you know, they, they wanted to, uh, I'd never really truly experienced Cub fans until I'd go see my cousins. and. They give us a hard time about being Cardinal fans. I think, what, what is this all about? The war still goes on. Oh yeah, they still. Well, it's <laughs> well, it just the beginning. Yeah, I still <laughs> think that's the best series, the Cubs and the Cardinals. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I, I was down hope to continues the way it is. Huh? I hope it continues the way. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah, the yeah, games are yeah. better. The series will be better. Yeah. Yeah. We're just one out in the wild card. Remember that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, 
<laughs> so your Major League Baseball career is over. You come back to Iowa to finish your, your uh, was it your master's degree? Right. And what, Dwayne asked you to consider coaching with him? He asked me if I would uh, entertain the idea of coaching and, and having a split position also being into the academic side as well as coaching. I had an opportunity to take on a head coaching job out east that I got offered. I interviewed and was offered a job out there. And then Bump Elliott and Dwayne talked to me about staying around and, and building a support program and also helping the baseball team. So I did that for five years. Five what? Six years. What convinced you to do that? You had other offers. As opposed to coaching. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, was it Dwayne Banks? Was it Bump Elliott? Uh, it was a combination of all that, as well as, you know, I'm not a person, uh, never has been one to want to move around a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, I was a, more of a family person. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, having to go out east and start a new <coughs> life and meet new friends and people, all those kind of things, uh, didn't quite gel well with me. And so, staying back here and being embraced by the community and people here, I thought it was worthwhile. Yeah. And did you have any idea 38 years ago that you'd be here the entire time? I mean, was that no, a realistic goal? No, I, I never thought long term um, because I'm so busy building things and, and working with others to get policy procedures in place. And, and my schedule was just, just go, the years just, just flew by. I had other opportunities to leave and, and interviewed for other positions when I was invited to, to uh, look into them. But no, uh, I never thought I'd be here all my career. Um, I'm pleased that I, it, it ended up that way. But on the same token, uh, just so busy, just trying to get things done. I didn't, I didn't talk about salary. I didn't talk about titles. I talked about getting things done to set a foundation for the students here at the university who for years to come can benefit from it. That was what's important to me. All those other things will come if you do the right thing. And I believe in that wholeheartedly and that's the way I live my life. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I often am. <laughs> that's true. Are you, are you the last employee for the athletic department that started at the field house? Ooh, good question. Um, We've had uh, uh, John Streif on here. Yeah, He's gone. gone. Is, is we Harry Ostrander Harry? officially retired, or is he still working? Phil had his retired. Right. Mick Walker. Is, is he was Fieldhouse, sure. He, he came in the late part of Yeah. He helped us move to Carver. Ah. Okay. Uh, so Mick Walker might be the... Uh, Long-standing. Long what about Rick Clatt? Rick came when we were in Carver. Yeah. They hired okay. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So Mick Walker is probably the last, the last uh, field house holdover. You might yeah. Say. The last <laughs> connection to the old field house. I believe he, he would be the one. Wow. Now think how far the athletic, and not just the Iowa athletic department, but NCAA athletic departments have come in the time since you started at Iowa. Mm -hmm. there Maybe you know, but there weren't many employees in the old field house compared to what we have today. Right. Um, we've got a lot more staff now than we had back in the day. And we're doing a lot more things today mm -hmm. than we did yeah. yesterday. So, you know, um, it, it, we're no different than other programs around right. the country at, at our level. You know, you have um, this group to do this, this group to do that, and um, you get more expertise, you bring in younger uh, minds who, who set a, a new course and direction. And, uh, I'll just point to football as an example, not just Iowa, but around the country. They've got many more staff than you ever mm -hmm. would dream about having. I, I bet in the old days when the coaches were coaching, they wish they, <laughs> they had the kind of staff that we have today. And you coach uh, uh, more. Uh, weight coach and stuff like that, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. You you have you have the strength and conditioning folks. You have the video folks. You have the recruiting folks. Yeah. You have huh. 
a specialist on this and that. You have nutrition. You have, <laughs> yeah. You, know, you got all this stuff. Try to get an edge or try to stay up with, with their uh, opponents. And um, it's, it's gotten itself to the point where uh, the demands and time demands on student athletes is, is overwhelming. Yeah. And then that needs to be addressed. NCAA is trying to address it now. Yeah. They're trying to figure out a better way of, of, of doing things. Well, you've been a part of that transition, too. On a national scale, you and the staff there have had to adjust mm -hmm. to the changes, the enormous amount of money that's now involved mm -hmm. in college athletics. That's the big difference. And that's how schools are able to afford larger staffs uh, because there's so much more money in it now. You were here in 77 when Iowa resumed the football series with Iowa State. Right. And that game was on ABC TV. And that was a big deal. In this town, I mean, this town was nuts for a week leading up to that game. And I can still remember as a student worker at Kinnick, you know, ABC had to come in and build platforms to put the TV cameras on. We hadn't had anything like that in years at, at Kinnick. And, and, uh, and now every game's on TV. Every game. That's a lot of money and a lot of changes for the kids. Well, speaking of all those changes and all the money and the Big Ten Network and all that, Fred, what do you think will really happen in regards to the student athletes getting a piece of that pie, a little bit, a monthly stipend, or is that really on the uh, horizon, do you think? Or? Well, miscellaneous expenses are things that uh, they're looking at and have looked at, and I think they develop a method to, to provide a little bit more um, uh, income to students. And, um, and that's something I know the, the NCAA has worked on uh, quite hard. And I think this, this next year that there should be some realization of that for our student mm -hmm. athletes. Now the big problem is you don't have consistency for cost of attendance at one institution from another institution. So the amount could vary what, what the student yeah. athletes could get. And, uh, so uh, it's yet to be seen how it all works out. So there's a great fear that people will use it as recruiting enticements where one school could say, well, we can give you $6,000 more on top of your scholarship, whereas you go to this school, you're going to get $3,000 right. more because right. the gap the cost of attendance with the scholarship. Chris, uh, this is a different subject, but uh, the new building over there is a beautiful building. Which one? Uh, oh, the football complex? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just went in there last week for the first time. I haven't wow. seen it yet. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's impressive. And that's one of the things that you see programs around the country trying to do. You talk about what's necessary to run a program. Well, everything, anything and everything's necessary. It's an arms race. If you listen to the people who, who mm -hmm. want it. Um, but if they start paying, let's say, $3,000, what are they going to do with these other sports? Well, that's the big problem they oh had at one time, and mm -hmm. they worked that out. So now, is a percent of what you have as a scholarship. It's not just for football and basketball; it's across the board. Oh, okay. And yeah. so you can you, the gap between the, your scholarship and the cost of attendance is something that everybody look at. But they've got it so that you can only get the percentage that you have a scholarship. Oh, okay. So if you only equivalency sports, you only got you get twenty percent. You can only get twenty percent of that gap. Okay. Okay, that's good. You know. mm. Well, that makes sense. Well, Fred, you've held a variety of duties at Iowa, primarily behind the scenes uh, administration work. Uh, you dealt with uh, a lot of the less glorified work in a power conference, and uh, those areas were NCAA compliance, student services. And diversity, and uh, as we just discussed, there've been a lot of changes in all three of those areas. I don't know how you keep your hand, or well, I don't know how you keep on top of NCAA compliance because of so many changes. There's so many changes, but there's great communication and collaboration with other uh, programs. Uh, the conference does a nice job of keeping you involved. Uh, many of us have served on NCA committees. I served on the NCA certification committee for four years, and that's a committee that looked at programs. And I, I personally have been on committees or groups that gone to campus and looked at programs like Florida, Stanford, 
North Carolina. I've, I've done about eight pro, eight or nine programs. And so you stay familiar with the rules because if you're looking at a program and you're talking about are you in compliance with these, this or that, you need to know what the rules are. And then you're making sure when you come home that you're doing the right things as well and try to cultivate a, a culture of compliance. Well, I think you, I'll speak for all of us, I think you've done a wonderful job in doing that. The University of Iowa has really never in those 38 years been targeted for any kind of infraction or major infraction, to be sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look at some of our competitors in the Big Ten, uh, <coughs> Illinois, and uh, <laughs> uh, we look at some of the other big schools in the country, mm -hmm. and you've done a great job of keeping the reputation of our school and the athletic department pristine. Well, you know, we've had our, our share of problems as well. Sure. So you, there's no program that's going to go unscathed. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it comes back again to what you believe in, what your culture, what your leadership believe in. And sometimes it, it's tough decisions that have to be made, whereas a lot of folks won't make those tough decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to make those tough decisions, make the, the, the statement that we believe in what we say. And so when people come to Iowa, they know our reputation as being that way, and they kind of adopt our culture here. And from time to time, we have some people who have transition problems. You know, they come from a different place, and their mindset is mm -hmm. different, and try to change our culture here. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we have to be careful about. You know, the one thing I would say wholeheartedly is that we have great fan support. I remember the days when we had losing football season, we still have 45,000 people. Oh, that's right, very true. Oh, yeah. and, and it's important not to forget your history, but understand that times have changed, and intercollegiate athletes are mm -hmm. ever-changing, always challenging. Especially and, salaries. Uh, well, salaries, oh, oh, you know, mm -hmm. if you get the, the, the compensation part of it in the mix, <coughs> we're talking about huge dollars now. It's, it's not mm -hmm. just... It just uh, uh, chump change. Nobody would get <laughs> But, you know, those kind of things puts a little bit more burden on you and, and, and more temptations on people to do things <laughs> to get an upper hand. But if you've got a, a culture that's rich and, and true, then I think you can survive it. Well, that's true. Uh, but a good example of what you're saying. It almost costs, not quite, as much to park for seven games and donation than the ticket. <laughs> well, I mean, if I'm going to get a good spot, then I have to give four or five thousand dollars. <laughs> Do you see what I'm getting? At? I, I hear what you say. <laughs> yeah, the contributions is a very important part of, of where we're at today. Uh, television yeah. brings in a great deal of money, but uh, the, uh, the contributions are still something they look heavily at. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, Talk a little bit about student services and how they have evolved since you started school as a student athlete. Well, we didn't have much in existence when I was a student athlete here. Uh, you could go in and get a voucher to go find your own tutor mm -hmm. if, yeah. if you needed help. And since then, uh, I, when I came back here and started a support program, it was myself and just two other people. And then uh, right now the staffing uh, is probably 15, 20 people yes. and doing different things. But, uh, and, and your big programs around the country is the same, the same way. Yeah. What I'm most proud of, though, as far as student services, I have a lot of uh, my interns and former employers, employees, I should say, who are out there running their own programs right now around the country. Yeah. And I just got a call from uh, a young man uh, last week who just took an athletic director's job out in Colorado who worked for me and just got started with me. Really? And I have another one who's just interviewing uh, wow. yesterday at a major institution also to take over the program. That's gratifying. So yeah. It makes you feel good. And they keep in contact, too, and that's, that's, that's nice. Uh, talk about diversity at the University of Iowa. Diversity in the Big Ten at the NCAA level? Well, I, I guess I, I would say this, you know, everyone tries to do the best job they can to, to diversify their program. And here at the university, we've done a nice job through the years of, of working uh, to make sure we have diverse teams. We have a policy in the athletic department that uh, require our coaches, if they're doing a search, to make sure they have a diverse pool. And if they don't have a diverse pool, 
uh, then uh, the athletic director will send them back to the table. You need to identify potential people who might be able to come here and be supported. But that's not the, the answer to everything. That's a, that's a first step. Mm -hmm. the, the other step is familiarity. And I think what you see around the country is that people aren't comfortable with individuals they aren't around much. And so what they're doing now is bringing people in as interns, and then they get to know them, and then those interns can stay on and become permanent employees. And so we're trying to get a, a, a feeder system in place where we can maybe cultivate and get more diversity. When you came here, I'm guessing there were no black coaches at the University of Iowa. Head coaches? Any. Uh, well, Any basketball coach. we had. Um, uh, one of our assistant basketball coach was uh, African American, mm -hmm. uh, and usually you'll find that your basketball and football will have African American coaches. What about our track coach? Were you? Uh, Ted Wheeler. Oh, Ted yeah. Wheeler. Yeah, he was Ted for a was long a, time. He was yeah. assistant coach there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ted that's right. Was assistant coach. Yeah, Chris was all right. Chris was the head coach, right? And uh, and now, thirty eight years later, we've got. Many more African American students, student athletes, coaches here just at the University mm -hmm. of Iowa. Uh, the women's program, it's not just about skin color, it's about gender too. Uh, yeah. Look how far just the women's athletic department has come. Well, it's all one athletic department now. Right. Uh, but the women's programs, look how far they've come since you first started. Well, you know, and Christine Grant has uh, done a nice job mm -hmm. yeah. and has been very supportive about student athletes, male or female. You know, uh, she's done well for, for gender equity issues, but uh, just uh, human rights issues and treating people right. right, and that's more important than anything else. And um, if, you, if you do right by students, you'll have your success. I said that to the head coaches who when they heard I was retiring. I'm, we met the head coaches and I indicated to them. I said, we talk about winning and, and there's an obsession out there right now about winning, winning. You know, I asked people, I said, go back 20 years and take football and put a chalk mark beside the name of the school that's won a national championship. And then go back and look at those national championships season and see how much luck they had during the course of that season to get to be a national <laughs> champion. Good yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we talk about we got to win, we got to win, we got to be a national championship, we got to win this and that. Let's face reality. That's right. Step back a bit. Take a deep breath. Everybody can't win. Everybody's not going to win. But what's most important is the quality of experiences that the students have and supporters have. I'll never forget, we played the Alamo Bowl against Texas. We lost that game. But the Texas fans clapped and applauded our athletes as they walked out the field because they played well and very time. competitive. That's what sports is all about. Yeah. I remember that game. I do too. Well, I was long there. Ago. <laughs> so did you see that? Crumb. Yeah. You felt proud. You felt proud. Yeah, that's you, right. you walked out there, you didn't know we lost. That's you right. felt good because they were competitive and they gave a good <laughs> effort. And that's what it's all about. Then we went to Arizona and they darn near killed us. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> was that Arizona or Arizona yeah. State? Arizona. Was it? Well, hands there are pretty nasty. Yeah. But we, they're both the same. But yeah. then we, we were like eight, eight straight to lie. But ain't no the Big Ten with. Drew Tate is our quarterback. Wasn't that the year? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. 04? Well, Fred, you bring up a really good point. Uh, people these days are so worked up about winning, winning, winning. And really, it's more about the experience, not just as a player or coach or fan, but the, the, the overall experience for a student athlete. And the degree. That's the most important thing. Well, yeah. the growth and development of young people, that's what the sport was supposed to be about, especially at this, this level. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> there's going to be some, uh, like myself, who have a chance to go professionally. Some are going to make it uh, very big in that profession. But that's a small percentage. We want to give them the tools and the opportunity mm -hmm. to experience that. But what about the majority of folks <clears throat> that come through that mm -hmm. and have this athletic experience? Yeah. You want to feel good about it, what you've done. That's right, Fred. Yeah. Uh, we've just got a few minutes here left. Um, 
Five minutes, okay. You, uh, at the end of your career, you were focused primarily on two sports at the University of Iowa, wrestling and baseball. And wow, did uh, Rick Heller, who we just had on the show earlier this summer, did he turn things around in a hurry? Uh, that yeah. had to be a good experience for you as a baseball man. A very good experience, uh, only from the standpoint that we brought Rick in, who's an Iowan, who really loves the sport of baseball. Yeah. And he interacts well with the students. I mean, his athletes like him. You know, he's, he's all about building skills and working in the little things that's going to make you better. And, you know, I'm very impressed with him. I travel with the team here toward the end of the year. And then when they lose a game, you know, he gets on the bus, he's talking to them, and he's not yelling and shouting or this or showing a lot of emotion. He's talking to them about the things you could have done better. You let this one get away from you, you know. We can't do anything about it. It's behind us now. But remember, you need to work on this a little bit, think about this a little bit more so. You know, he's teaching, always teaching. Makes you proud yeah. to be a hockey. Oh, you know, yeah. And I sit there and enjoy it and yeah. listen to that. And Tom Brands does the same thing. He, he <laughs> might talk one way. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. But when he's, if you ever get a chance to be in the locker room with him, he's teaching. He's talking about life, about developing skills and things that's going to stay with him for life. And, 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 you, and in the meantime, you're going to have success. You dedicate yourself to doing it the right way. He talks a lot about that. Kind of How about his brother? Same. Yeah. They were saying they both were very, very yeah. good people, mm -hmm. very caring people. Mm -hmm. Former Hawkeye student athletes who went on to yeah. success in the Olympics uh, and now are having success in the coaching world. Uh, let's talk while well, we've got just another minute or two, uh, just off top of the mind, uh, some of the notable student athletes who went through the university while you were here. I think of one right away, Ronnie Lester. Ronnie Lester, yes, Ronnie was, was a great star, very humble. Quality very humble, kid. Very humble, and, and, and you know, you like people like that. Uh, Andre Tippett, for example. Yeah, you know, yeah. Great person. You know, every time uh -huh. I saw him at the Maryland game, and yeah. he, he's calling me Mr. Mill. You know, they call me Mr. Mill. Oh, but I have to, Mr. Mill. <laughs> <laughs> you must have made a difference in his life well, while he was here. He, he, he thanked me for being there and, and working <clears> with <throat> him. And there's been so many, so many uh, students that come Excuse me about Tibbet. He gave me a kiss. Oh, did he? That line was a, oh, it was a block long. And we drove up in a golf cart, and he sees me, and he said, Excuse me, and he jogged over there and he gave me a kiss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right on it. Yeah. And, and I thought that was pretty damn nice. Guys yeah. like you have yeah. raised him, a kid far from home, from New Jersey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in a land unknown. And you made a difference in his life. And Tippett. That was important. Yeah. yeah. Tippett yeah. and uh, uh, Granger and Hunter were all from the same school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I visited that school. Mm. <laughs> good people again. Oh, very, yeah. very good students. They had a policeman on every gate. Oh. And it, I was surprised at the classroom. They were they were teaching. I went to English class, and, <laughs> and it was really good. And I, I was really Joe. proud of them. <clears throat> yeah. Go ahead, Fred. Well, yeah, Fred. Let's. We're going to wrap it up. Anybody else comes to mind? Well, there's so many in, in, oh. in all the sports, and I, I would be remiss if I just named a couple here yeah. and there. We just been very, very fortunate. We had some outstanding people to come through this university and our athletics program. We were doing very, very well. And I'm honored to have spent this many years in, in association with these great people and being mentored and, and working with the administration of the university and coaches. It's been a, a blessing. Well, I have to say that, and I'm sure we all feel, Iowa gets the best leadership of all people. Good point, bud. And you're yeah. one of the great ones that been here a long time. Well, you know, Gilbert, Illinois is not too far away from here, and, and, and I never knew much about the University of Iowa, uh, but on the same token, uh, after coming here, I see why people are very fond of, of this institution in this yeah. town. 
Well, we're glad you came, Fred, and we're glad you stayed. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <And> still, <laughs> still, still stay here. Well, 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 he, he pulled for his wife, boys. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now he's got Susan <laughs> running the city. Yeah. We've <laughs> <laughs> been visiting with Fred Mams, longtime athletic <laughs> department administrator for the University of Iowa. We've run out of time, but Fred, you're always welcome back here on Sports Opinion. We appreciate your time. And on behalf of Bob Boyd, Bud Supel, and Earl Murphy, I'm Dirk Keller thanking you for watching every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., Sunday nights at 6 p.m., or you can go to uh, patv.tv and check out all of our old programs, or you can just go to my Facebook page and see them there. On behalf of all these guys, we appreciate you tuning in, and remember this, either you're a hawk or you're not. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we ran out of time.